member for Bass, Ms. Finlay. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise this afternoon to give my contribution in reply to the state budget that was handed down last week. Um, and it's interesting, as the Minister leaves the Chamber, on the closing comments about what's important to this government is, in fact, how I will open about what is worrying uh, about this government's position uh, and the budget that has just handed down for Tasmanians. Probably um, one of the most... Oh, no, I've, I've been here a year. This is my second chance to respond to a budget. Uh, it's a year of experience of listening to this government talk up and, you know, being positive is really important, but talking up things that aren't reality. Yeah. Uh, and I think our community would much prefer for governments to be honest with them um, in order that we can understand how we do have to work together to make improvements in our community. Um, it's really disappointing. It could be lots of other adjectives, but it's disappointing when the government actually present a budget and they say that it's about strengthening the future. That'd be great. It'd be really good if this government had the ability to deliver to strengthen the future. Um, but actually, probably most insulting, it says it's delivering for all Tasmanians. And just out of question time this morning, we know absolutely that this government doesn't deliver for all Tasmanians. We had a number of um, older members of our community who are so deeply anxious about their current housing situation because after months and months and months of advocacy, they still have uncertainty about their living arrangements in a few weeks. There is no way that this government can say they're delivering for all Tasmanians, and so they shouldn't. Mm. It, it riles me up um, in my seat at the back when I have to listen to ministers upon ministers upon ministers talking about the things that they're doing, when they could actually just say, it's really hard right now, things are tough right now, the economy going OK but not fantastic. Um, they talk up and the minister just in his closing talked about business confidence. But if we were honest with our community, if you guys are, as we are, honest with our community, we could actually work to solve uh, and to provide outcomes from the community that are actually really real. What I want to unpack in my budget response today um, is a little bit about the difference between the economy and the budget, because they're not the same thing. Sometimes I think this government think the economy and the budget is the same thing. But I also want to unpack a little bit about how this budget delivers effort, hopefully action and outcomes, that put in place their policies. And I want to unpack, really, there's a lot of people that talk about figures and percentages and line items when they talk about the budget. But actually, what we're doing is talking about impact on people and impact on community. The minister just closed by talking about thriving communities. In fact, the premier, in his own response, talked about how this is going to be strengthening for the future, delivering for all Tasmanians, and um, creating thriving communities. But what can I tell you is that a result of many of your policies are undermined and collapsing communities, um, and where those challenges are real, you have to be honest with the community about the challenge and the struggle you are going to have to work through to rectify these challenges and impacts. Now, when we talk about the economy, um, it's good to defer to competent organisations. The um, COMSEC report is often referred to, and I know that um, others here, our Shadow Tre Treasurer, our Shadow Finance Minister, um, our leader, in fact, I think even our Deputy Leader, have talked about how you can say whatever you want, but people actually can read the charts. People understand what these things say. And despite um, the government saying that Tassie is leading the nation. In fact, this report says that. We have, I heard um, part of the contribution from the Shadow Finance Minister just earlier, that you have to be real about what is actually presenting. It's presenting a relative position relative to our past. Um, and so on one measure, Tasmania is leading. Um, and that's great, on equipment investment. But when you actually go through the other elements of the economy, on economic growth, Western Australia is leading. On retail spending, Victoria is the strongest. Um, Tasmania is the strongest in equipment, event, equipment investment. But on unemployment, Western Australia has the strongest job market. In construction work, South Australia is strongest for construction work. Population growth, Queensland le leads the relative population growth. In housing finance, Victoria is in the top spot for home loans. With dwelling starts, South Australia leads the way on dwelling starts. So when you cherry pick stats from a document, you've got to trust that someone's not going to go back and read the entire document and say that, yes, Comsec says mm -hmm. on in equipment investment, Tassie's doing all right. But on every other element, um, we are now not at the top. 
Tasmania did hold the mantle for the best performing economy, but after leading on four of the eight indicators in the previous survey, Tasmania now only leads on one. And then the um, government continue to talk about business confidence. Now, um, in the area of Bass, we know in Northern Tasmania, Northern Tasmanians are the place where we actually get out and do the work, and the South has often been the, the heart of government, the North the heart of enterprise. So I know a little bit about business, having had businesses myself, I know how to read results of surveys, and I understand as the shadow for small business how small businesses, not just in the bubble of Hobart, but across the entire um, Tasmanian community, and particularly in rural and regional communities, how they're feeling. Now, two months ago, um, in the NAB monthly business survey, it showed that Tasmania was the only state where business confidence is negative. Worryingly, it's been negative now for three consecutive months. Roy Morgan business survey showed that Tasmania had the lowest business confidence in the country. But then again in April, the NAB group, um, they're a leading team of economists to provide accurate, timely and relevant updates on the domestic economy and economic trends. Now, in April, it says that business confidence remains relatively high across industries and in most states. However, Tasmania is showing noticeable weaker levels. Conditions and confidence in Tasmania have softened. So it's not okay. What, the thing that gets me is, I suppose, um, people feel like in the cover of parliament you can stand up and say anything. And it worries me that it doesn't seem like people have this internal um, integrity gets thrown around a bit here, but this internal sort of um, expectation that you would tell the truth. Yeah. So we're doing okay, um, but we're not topping out on every element to do with the economy, and business confidence has softened, and that should cause problems. If the small business minister was able to leave Hobart and go out into the regions, then she would hear from businesses that are finding it tough, and we would be positive about what we could do to work together to turn that around. Now, when we talk about the budget um, and the budget position of this government, they would have us believe that things are going swimmingly. They would have us believe that the things that they say are actually included in the budget, uh, and the announcements they make in the community are actually things that they either um, expect or intend to deliver, or in fact, have the capacity to deliver. Um, and I, for one, having been in this place for a year now, am questioning that seriously. So one of the first documents that dropped um, just after I got elected last year, it was perfect timing really, because it gave me this overall insight into um, the way Treasury looks at the Tasmanian system and also how then the government would, you assume, um, take the advice or read up on these documents from Treasury. They delivered the Tasmanian Government Fiscal Sustainability Report. Um, and that report, uh, it considers the longer term sustainability of the state's finances and it gives it under four different scenarios. Now those scenarios are about, and this word's important early, early action to correct fiscal deterioration, um, to give consideration to the composition of the state's revenue base, uh, to consider any action to maintain fiscal sustainability, um, and also uh, look at um, the likely effect to manage fiscal sustainability, which will require early action. Now, um, I don't know whether members of the government have read this report, but to reference page 26, um, there's a chart, and it charts out um, the four different scenarios. So if we just continue on the forward estimates, and this was um, prior to last year's budget, but this year's budget isn't drastically different. Uh, the most positive scenario possible is considering the forward estimates. And of course, your forward estimates are gonna be positive because you write those documents. Um, but if you actually considered historical trends, that's actually the next worrying um, likely scenario going forward over the forward estimates. Then there's a low revenue base, but then there's a high expenditure. The worst possible scenario for Tasmania is continued high expenditure without any early and significant action. And what we know is that this government um, will announce whatever it wants to, will say it will deliver whatever it thinks the Tasmanian community will believe in order to continue to support them, but it doesn't necessarily translate into the budget documents and it definitely doesn't um, translate into outcomes. The other thing we know is that this government just keeps blowing its budget. Um, my understanding is when I've done some quick calculations over the life of the budget, that's about a billion dollars worth of blowouts. 
Um, and what we now see in the documents is that we're heading towards or we're, we're estimating $5.2 billion worth of debt now growing, and that if you read this fiscal sustainability report projected over the next 10 years, um, and we're on the trajectory at the moment for the worst possible scenario, that that could blow out and head towards $30 billion. Now, what does that mean for the things that are really important to Tasmanians? We hear everyone talk about it, the government included, health, education, housing. What does it mean for the people that were in the gallery today that for months, for 18 months, have been sharing their concern with the government about the need to have support for their housing circumstances when the NRAS scheme comes to an end? I was, I was embarrassed to be a member of this parliament this morning. Yeah. I was embarrassed to be in this chamber when a minister would stand up with really legitimate questions with members of our community here present who are so anxious about their circumstances and that um, no, no, they, they, they talk about being a government with heart. No heart was provided in the response uh, and it was all politicised that perhaps our new federal minister for housing could fix it for the full lifetime of the government here in the state of Tasmania when there has been a Liberal government in the Federal government where brought to your attention has been these concerns, although you should already understand them all on your own, you could have been doing this work and taking action. Yep. But the thing that I've learnt in my last year here is that this government doesn't take responsibility, they don't take the time to understand the real issues and they definitely don't or don't know how to take action. In my office, I'm seeing people all the time with challenges around housing, and I'm also seeing a number of people that are sleeping rough and that don't have permanent, a permanent place to call home. Um, I understand from conversations I had, there could be 300, as many as 500 people sleeping rough, rough every night in the Launceston community. And it's great to see that there's extra funds in the government for homelessness support, 11 extra spaces in Launceston at Safe Spaces. Safe Spaces is fully occupied, night on night. 300 people sleeping rough. Now we know coming into winter, that's just gonna get worse. We know with things like the end of NRAS, we know with um, low wages, rising cost of living, that these statistics are gonna get worse. Having 10 year plans, having $1.5 billion um, strategies, doesn't actually do something for Tasmanians now, tonight, that need shelter. Yes, you need to consider the future, but this document says that you're delivering for all Tasmanians. You are not, as a government, delivering for all Tasmanians. When we know that, although you stand there and say, it's everyone's right to have a home, it's everyone's right to have a roof over their head, we know that tonight in Launceston, 300 people don't have that comfort, that safety that surety, and something needs to be done now to turn that around. Now, the other thing that I've been appalled about in my year here, and it would never have happened at the Launceston City Council, was this trend to make announcements and never intend to deliver. Um, so I could talk about, for instance, and there always seem to be curiously around an election time, they always seem curiously to be the solution to a massive problem that generationally hasn't been attended to because perhaps it's not deliverable. But this government, for instance, the Tamar Bridge, this government dredging, and we've already talked about today, the LGH. To announce to a community that you are going to invest $580 million in the redevelopment of the local hospital who has the worst bed block in the country, who has ambulances ramping, who in our community across Tasmania we see massive waiting lists, people waiting for specialists, that you say, we've got the solution. Big, you know, the carrot for the people to come and vote for you, but then year on year you don't deliver in budget the funds that you have said, even in your own budget documents, that 580 million is allocated. It's not. There is 50 million, far short of $580 million in the forward estimates. I think the people in our community want to trust the people in this place, but the performance of this government makes it harder day on day for the members of our community to trust this government. I can remember just before the former Premier left, there was a tight moment. It was tough in the week of Parliament. We'd had ministers leaving, we'd had all sorts of drama. We know that they were feeling under pressure and the lack of integrity in their ranks was just coming to the fore and it was all falling apart. So 
we make an announcement at the Commonwealth Games. <laughs> now, I mean, the, the, the government, you can tell when they're really struggling, when they're really desperate, because that was just ridiculous. Nobody who would have been involved with that had heard about it, but it was just a good idea that would start to distract from the really important issues that are facing the people of Tasmania. It's a little bit like the floating stadium. Yeah. Now, you talk about... And, and again, I just can't get away from what happened this morning. The minister says, give me two weeks, trust me, I'll find you a solution. We've got people in our community that can't sleep, are finding it difficult to eat because of the level of anxiety about their current housing situation. We've got people last week that were evicted from their homes under the NRAS, end of the NRAS deal and are now living in their car. Yeah. But this government thinks that's appropriate and reasonable to invest over a billion dollars for a stadium in the south when the government's own report said very clearly that um, to reinvest further in the stadium that we've got in the north at York Park, to reinvest where people come from across the state that can enjoy that sport, we know that people will travel from the south to the north because it's great where I come from. Um, we know that people will do that and people talk about the minister, the sports minister seems to be the only body actually at the moment that's advocating this. The Premier seems to have stepped away 100 miles an hour um, but talks about the benefits of having a stadium in your community. We know in the north the benefits. We know in Launceston the benefits because we've lived through that, through winter in the stimulus to the economy but we already have that infrastructure and that investment. It requires a marginal improvement to those facilities to have the seating numbers, for football, but also there's proposals for the multi-sports courts, which would see a far greater outcome for all Tasmanians, delivering for all Tasmanians, than a billion dollar stadium in the south when we can't house Tasmanians right now. To me, making those sorts of investments is just way off the mark of what people expect in Tasmania. Mm -hmm. Now, in the time that I've got to make my contribution, I did want to reflect... Um, as I said, these sorts of things just come. Announcements are made uh, as an attempt to distract. But I've also learnt that announcements are made without consultation just to completely shift priorities um, in different industries that support communities. We talk about thriving communities. Um, the communities that I visit, yes, I visit the cities, but I also visit the rural and regional communities. And I see the types of industries that make a difference in those communities. Just last week, there was this really um, weird thing that happened that when we asked questions further about, we didn't get any clarification on, about the salmon industry. I'm Shadow Minister for Primary Industries and Water, and aquaculture, fishing, um, agriculture are all parts of that. And I'm really proud to represent those people and to work with the yeah. people in these industries. And last week, it was weird. There was this sort of correction. There was a, um, a, a, an update to a really significant policy, which in itself came out of nowhere. So at the end of last year, there was a, a moratorium announced on the salmon industry. Um, in terms of all our primary industries, the greatest contributor uh, to employment, to jobs, to, to local communities, um, really smart and great jobs. And there was this correction made uh, after a response in the parliament where in response to a question about the fish industry, the minister quite rightly uh, made a whole lot of positive comments about the industry and then, and then made a mistake and she said, while the plan is being developed, there'll be no further increases um, in the leasable area. And I think she meant to say no net increases. Fine. So she sent in Mr Street later in the day uh, to correct that. But the correction, instead of being three lines long, was seven lines long. And then it said just from nowhere, importantly, one of the principles undermining the development of the plan which is for 10 years, not a one-year moratorium, there will be no net increases in total, total leasable areas. Now, that's a massive shift. I don't know, Mr Ellis is in the, in the chamber right now. I don't know what he thinks about that. I don't know what um, this government is trying to do in undermining one of the greatest contributors to regional and rural communities in Tasmania. Um, but when we sought to clarify that the very next day, there was silence. Mm. The salmon industry is full of great and clever jobs. I've met with people uh, down at Whale Point that work on the net lab. I've worked and met with people in East Devonport in the processing, with divers at Rowella. Um, I've been into the CBD where they've got these incredible um, feed centres. Tasmania should be proud and should support this industry and to have just policy decisions thrown out in the middle of question time seemingly um, without consideration or on consultation, uh, this industry deserves much better. But I'm going to just um, talk about another industry that deserves better and um, tie in 
the government's budget, allocations that are in the budget to do certain work which will drive policy outcomes. Now I'm the shadow for small business um, and uh, small businesses, everyone says it in lots of different ways, the lifeblood of Tasmania. Of the almost 41,000 small business, or 40, 41,000 businesses in Tasmania, 97% of them are classified as small. Um, but what I think people forget, um, and I'm hoping that the Minister hears this, is that small businesses are all types of businesses. And when you look at the government's own interim business growth strategy, um, it identifies that agriculture, forestry and fishing is the second largest industry sector by number of businesses in Tasmania. Um, obviously, I'm across agriculture and fishing, um, our shadow treasurer across forestry. But in the fishing sector, um, we talk about small businesses being the backbone of the Tasmanian economy. Well, in the wild fisheries, we talk about rock lobster being the backbone of the wild fisheries sector. Um, and right now, um, as a result of a budget impact, which is gonna drive a policy, this government who says that they're, and I'm just gonna pick up this document again because I can't believe it, so I can't ever remember what it is, says that they're strengthening the future, <laughs> delivering for all Tasmanians, is going to seemingly make a decision that is going to collapse the local fishing fleet in the rock lobster fishery. Um, now, I got a letter um, recently from the mayor of Breakaday. Um, he was, has been for many, many years, a commercial fisherman in his own right. So he, he gets this. So I'm gonna just read in a little bit of the comments that he makes about um, connecting up, just in case anyone doesn't quite understand it, and if the minister can read this back later so she doesn't quite understand it, which actually really highlights the connections between the budget, the economy, policy, and communities, about people, about delivering for Tasmanians. So there's a review process. It's um, reviewing the rules, uh, and there's a particular concern about a rule which is to expand the 60-pot area. So this letter reads, it was written on the 5th of May, it reads, the review process is of particular interest to council as it has significant economic, social, and environmental implications to Tasmania. Mm -hmm. The orthodox economic efficiency argument is at the expense of smaller operators. This inequitable approach benefits larger commercial fishing operators and is feared to have long-term impacts on the continued consolidation of these operators in the Tasmanian rock lobster fishery. It is of Breakaday Council's belief that in the absence of an economic and social analysis of the proposed rule and policy changes, a precautionary principle approach must be applied. As the discussion paper outlines on page 30, there are significant economic and social contributions local vessels offer to Eastern Tasmania. It is easy to quantify some contributions. However, contributions such as sense of community and indirect economic impact are not considered. It is of our belief that the risks presented to the East Tasmanian economy have not been adequately considered. As such, we ask that the committee apply a precautionary principle approach to the proposed rule and policy changes when considering the economic and social risks to the East Coast of Tasmania. The Breakaday Council's approach is underpinned by the belief that long-term impacts must be considered over short-term gain. Breakaday Council strongly opposes the proposed rule change of expanding the 60-pot area and requests an in-depth economic analysis of the proposal to be delivered before implementation. This proposal is a relative and Ill, a reactive, sorry, and ill-advised response to the current market and does not consider long-term implications. This includes detrimental impact on the viability of smaller operators, as well as impact on local businesses, such as slipways, the boilermakers, who all depend on these operators. <coughs> The economic efficiency reasoning is not adequate to justify its implementation and is of clear inequitable benefit to the large operators at the expense of smaller operators. We expect this proposal will further consolidate quota and pots, forcing out smaller operators who cannot afford to increase their quota based on the size of their boat. The impact of such an occurrence would be detrimental to the Breakaday region's economy. Now, um, the East Coast is quite unique in terms of the rock lobster fishery, and um, 
I note with interest a number of responses that the Minister has made to questions in regard to um, regional communities um, and supporting communities through our fishery policy. Um, I've asked a number of questions either through the upper house or the lower house in terms of the Minister's support um, for small family fishers and she has said uh, in her responses that she does support um, small family fishers. However, there are complex views to consider and diverse views. Well, I went to a really um, tight community ecosystem to consider the diverse views, um, a, an area where you can really clearly understand a case study for the implications of this rule change, and that's King Island. Again, might be of interest to the member in the chamber. Um, now, King Island, about 15 um, fishers on King Island. I've had the chance now of running through a list of ringing them all. I've almost called everybody. But I just wanted to share um, some of the comments that I've heard so far uh, from 12 of the 15 fishers who all, without exception, don't support this rule change. Um, and I want to just talk in, when we're linking in budget implications of policy changes that have an impact on our economy, have an impact on the people in our small communities, what this means. Um, something like the rock lobster fishery, it's a tradition in Tasmania. It's been handed down in many cases through generations. It's a, as the former minister might say, a Tassie way of life. Um, and it can be said in no clearer terms than by talking to the fishers of King Island. Um, and I'm just going to share some of the comments that they made. So, um, and without identifying anyone particularly, we bought a farm. We started out on our own. We fished with four or five other blokes. We got our sea time and then we bought a boat. We worked it all up for ourselves and now we've got a boat, we've bought in some units. I went away to school, got some work experience. Four years in Burnie, got myself a trade, but then I decided that I missed the fishing, I missed the island. I got a job on a boat, I worked myself up, and now we're able to establish ourselves in the industry. So it's this cycle of people contributing, growing up, and then re-contributing into their communities. Um, what this rule change is going to do is make it hard for the next generation. Yeah. I've been on the deck for a really long time. My grandfather used to fish this fishery. I'm worried that we're all going to get squeezed out. People are losing sight of the fact that we've got to start looking at the stocks, not just at people's back pockets. My dad used to say you can catch more fish with two 20-pot boats than one 40-pot boat. And that's because you're mindful of how you set. You're mindful of the fish. What someone else said, and I didn't bring the rules with me, but the rules are about as thick as the budget. Um, and there's this one rule just snuck in, and people, you know, they're feeling really done over by this. Um, people's fathers, uncles, grandfathers have fished this fishery, and now their sons are fishing this fishery. Um, but what's also interesting is that the families are supporting the life and supporting the community on the island. Um, there are people that have got as I said, some, some circumstances that dad's still fishing, they're fishing and their son's fishing. Um, and then their families are working on the island. We've got families that um, someone works in the local IGA or the local bakery. That's fairly standard. They might work and deliver the local, local beauty services, work in a farm, um, work in the cheese factory, but a lot of them work in the childcare centre, work at the school, um, their nurse at the local medical centre, uh, run the local real estate agency. You lose the fishery, you collapse this fishery on King Island, you will lose these vital services and these people, these families from generations from this community. So in raising to make my contribution to the budget this afternoon, I want to say, why doesn't the government take a step back, have a think about, if you actually want to govern for all Tasmanians, that you start to be honest about what that's going to take. You start to be honest about the announcements that you make. You start to be honest about the documents that you're reading from or the charts or the data you're looking at and the commentary you run over the top of it. I can remember the Shadow Treasurer said, um, that there was feedback from himself and others at the budget roadshow. He put up a chart on the screen. I was at the budget luncheon in Launceston. and he put up a chart on the on the screen and you could see the downturn, but they put a line across it to show an upward tick and said things are all right. And I can remember at my table, people are going, can they tell that we can see that? Like we can actually see what the chart says. 
you're actually just embarrassing yourselves. I think Tasmanians want better and I know that they deserve better. I want to push this government to do the right thing. I know that our Premier, deep down, probably does have a heart for all Tasmanians. I know that deep down he wants to do the right thing. It's time now that you guys stand up, you step up and you are brave and you tell Tasmanians what the reality is and that when you make announcements, you make real announcements with real intention to deliver. Because I know for one that our community in Bass in northern Tasmania and in fact the communities that I represent through being Shadow Minister for Small Business, Shadow Minister for Startups and Shadow Ministers for Primary Industries and Water, that they all expect better. Things haven't been easy. Things are softening off. We need to make sure that there was a minister call this morning for tripartite support and agreement on things. If we trusted and believed you in what you actually wanted to deliver Tasmanians, we probably would follow up and work with you. But right now it's your job. Stand up, do the right thing, stop making announcements that have zero intention to deliver and start actually delivering for all Tasmanians. Oh, yeah, minister for